open your Bibles to John chapter 4. Put up a timeline chart that you have on the screen. There on the screen, you see increments of 2,000 years in the first three different spaces, spaces going left to right. Year one and two, year 1,000, 2,000 covers Adam to Abraham. Year 3,000 to 4,000 co covers Abraham to Christ. So if you look at Adam to Christ, I don't believe his birth, by the way. I believe his death, in this case, and his resurrection, is 4,000 years. Then the next 2,000 year increment is the 5th and 6th thousand year, which we are at the end of, where Christ will return once again to initiate the last thousand years before the eighth thousand years where the new heaven and new earth begin is the millennium period. So you have from left to right broken up with the line, horizontal line, you got 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, that's 6,000 years, followed by another 1,000, which makes the 7,000 years. Leave it up there for a few minutes so people can write it down. If you look at Bible chronology, it shows that we're approximately 2,000 years if you were living in Abraham's time you would have been living in about 2,000 years from the creation. From zero year, let's just call it that, until approximately Abraham's existence and death. You can find that in Genesis 5. And then you add another 2,000 years from Abraham until Jesus Christ. So, you got Adam to Abraham, Abraham to Christ, Christ to his return all in 2,000 year increments. It could be a coincidence. I don't think it is. And the millennium day being the final day in our present human history will be the last thousand years. I mean, if you look at it, you don't have to be a brain surgeon or any type of genius to see that there's a pattern here including the last pattern since Christ's death to his return probably will be another 2,000 years until his second coming. So if you look at each day in Christ's creation timeline consists of 1,000 years, then we have to take in consideration there will be two days or 2,000 years from Christ's death until the second coming. You got that? Now, last time I showed you in scriptures different passages that made the point concerning these certain days or thousand years, mostly in the New Testament, as I pointed out to you through the Bible stories that it's imprinted in there even though you can't see it. The message of Christ's first coming and His second coming. Now when you look at this particular timeline that I showed you, you also see analogies in the scriptures that point to the same thing. That's why I had you turn to John chapter 4. Let's go to verse 39. That's like, when you read any passage in the scriptures, there's so much meaning in so many verses than just the obvious meaning behind a verse. 
and what either Jesus was relating or the apostles were relating, especially in the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament. And you're going to see in the Old Testament when I get to the patriarchs, what a powerful message behind the message about Christ return, returning after this present 2,000 year period we're in, the second coming event. Verse 39 reads, And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him, for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all I ever did. This is where Jesus met up with a Samaritan woman. And in verse 40 it reads, So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. Think about that. Here Jesus is dealing with the Samaritan woman. And he goes with the Samaritan into the city. He starts testifying about himself. She starts testifying what Jesus said to her. And so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of the saving, of thy saving, of thy saying, excuse me, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. <clears throat> Jesus stayed with this Samaritan woman among the Samaritans in that city. In this case, the Samaritan woman typifies the type of church. A type of the church. He stayed there for two days. Isn't that ironic? That's what we just read. He stayed there for two days. Now, you might say that's a coincidence. You might say you're reading more into the scripture than it really is what it's trying to tell us, what's really there. Possibly. But you see this pattern once again developing. Not just in the scriptures, but other scriptures also. Jesus stayed with this woman, this Samaritan woman, which is a type of the church, for two days. Now you have to come to believe that Jesus is with his church now, his true church. These last two days in the timeline, a day equal to a thousand years, and since the church established, it's been two thousand years. One day, one thousand. Two days, two thousand. This just could be a strange coincidence, or is it an analogy that we can draw from? If we could find it somewhere else. That it's also used to add more insight into the scriptures than what we just normally pull from them. I believe you can. So write that down. Jesus stayed with the Samaritan woman, which is a type of the church, for two days. We just rest, read that. Could it also mean, can it also imply that Jesus would be with this church for 2,000 years? One day, 1,000, two day, two days, 2,000. Okay. Let's stay with the good Samaritan type. Let's go to Luke. Chapter 10. Verse... <clears throat> 
Let's see if we should start. Most of you know the Good Samaritan story. I'm just going to start at verse 10. Well, let's just, let's just read the whole chapter. Not the whole chapter, but part of the chapter. And behold, starting at verse 25, a certain Lord stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto them, Thou hast answered right, Did this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing, willing, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus, Jesus said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his remnant, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. No one was stopping to help this individual. But a certain Samaritan, he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence. Highlight that. He took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, even though Christ is not a Samaritan, we're going to look at this good Samaritan as a type of Jesus. Got it? This good Samaritan, as a type of Jesus, what did he give the innkeeper? Not one pence, but two pence. What is two pence equal to back then? Two pences were equal, I mean, two pences equaled approximately two days wages. Write that in the margin of your Bible there. The Good Samaritan, the type of Jesus, gave this innkeeper 2,000 years ago two pence to care for the individual on the side of the road. And two pence equals to two days wages. He gave them two days wages for care for this wounded individual. Furthermore, what else did he say? That he was going to return. So there's a promise to return in the scripture also. To do what? And settle the account. We know what the original meaning of the story is all about. People preach it about it every Sunday around this world. But I also want you to put your biblical detective hat on and start comparing some of these verses that I'm using, whether it's John or Luke or anywhere else, and see a pattern. That's why I said God's timeline is written everywhere. And by the time I'm done, just as I showed you the moon god religion, and we traced it, took me many weeks, tracing the moon god religion through the Old Testament. Remember that? In the last day series, those of you who haven't seen it or read about it yet, you can on the website, www.teachingfaith.com. I traced it. I plan to do the same thing with God's timeline, God's creation timeline, God's seven-day creation timeline. He promised to return and settle the account. Well, that's two coincidences now. 
One in John and one in Luke. There's also another one, and you will have to do a little bit more biblical detective work. I'm not going to spend that much time on it because I want to get to a certain point tonight. I don't want to run out of time. But during the six days before going to the wedding feast in Cana, Jesus took a trip. He took a trip on the fourth day. And guess what? He was not seen again until the seventh day. Another coincidence, I guess. And you can read about it through the earlier chapters of John. And then a little biblical detective work, you could piece it together that he took a trip. Jesus, out of nowhere, decides during the six days before the wedding feast at Cana to take a trip on the fourth day. And he didn't return until the seventh day. That means he was gone the fifth day and he was gone the sixth day. Put that timeline up again. What does that mean? He was gone in year 5,000 and year 6,000 if you want to believe this is not coincidence. And he will return once again during the millennium. Once again, this is a type and shadow, a picture that's painted that points to Jesus who was to come, who died for our salvation, the salvation of mankind. He was sacrificed from the foundation of the world according to Revelation chapter 13 and was killed at Passover 4,000 years after year zero. By the way, do you think it's also a coincidence when you read the creation story in the early chapter of Genesis, you think it's just a coincidence. When you start making all the connections and you connect all the dots, that life shows up at the fourth day in the creation story. At the fourth day. He creates so many different things, but life itself shows up at the fourth day. Christ shows up, back on that uh, timeline again, if put it up again. Life shows up after 4,000 years. From Adam to the death and resurrection of Christ is 4,000 years. Christ shows up after 4,000 years, and what does He bring with Him? Life. Eternal life. Now, I'm going to leave the New Testament for now. I want you to turn to Hosea in the Old Testament. Let's go to chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5. <clears throat> this chapter talks about how God punishes Israel, but there's more to it. This chapter paints a picture, a vivid picture, I believe, of the return of Jesus Christ, the Christ's second coming event, 2,000 years after his ascension. <clears throat> Most preachers kind of don't know how to preach on this particular chapter. Maybe you never even heard one even preached on this chapter. Because it fits in when you understand God's timeline and it gives support to a belief in the timeline, which I don't believe it's theory, by the way, that God has a 7,000 year plan in place. Let's read Hosea 5 15 
In fact, let's read Hosea 5.15 to Hosea 6. Two. Okay, let's just start with Hosea 5.15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. Let's read that again slowly. I will go return to my place I believe this is referring to Christ till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction they will seek me early. That's still yet to come. Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Take note now. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Not too many people know how to explain this verse. Let's read it one more time. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. Come, let's return to the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days. Let's stop right there. What does two days mean again? Two thousand years. One day, one thousand years. Two days, two thousand years in God's timeline. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. You look at the part, the part of the verse here that says, I will go and return to my place till he acknowledge their offense. What is that referring to? Could it be referring to Jesus returning to heaven after being rejected? After being crucified by the Jews? Could it also mean that he will remain there until they acknowledge their offense? And seek him, I believe, when this thing's about wrapped up and everything is coming at Israel, that little country in the Middle East, from all sides, and it looks bleak for them. Could it mean that? Something miraculous, if you look at it, their mindset now, happens where they seek the Lord and acknowledge their offense and seek Him when there's no hope left, which this verse calls it their affliction. It goes on to say, then they will return unto the Lord and be revived after two days. See, everything I'm, being, I'm presenting to you tonight, I don't believe it's a coincidence. I believe the harder you dig as a biblical detective, the more you come to understand the riches in God's Word from cover to cover there is. So much still needs to be explored. Now some of the avenues that I go down turn out to be dead ends. But when it happens to be 
a coincidence over and over again when it's repeatedly throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testament especially, you got to stop and take notice, friends. Just because people know how to preach on these scriptures doesn't mean that they're to be ignored. They're there for a reason. And that is to edify the body of Christ in the many ways that it does. Return to the Lord and be revived after two days. Put that timeline up again. Which equals the third, from left to right, time slot on that chart according to God's plan. I believe that 1948 date is not a coincidence either. And I've shown that through the last day series. I believe it was the beginning of a preparation for a revival. Not what most Christians believe a revival should be like. But the nation of Israel revival in the very last of days before the Lord's return. Which will happen according to these scriptures. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sights. This is, no doubt in my mind by the way, referring to the nation being totally revived. And restored. A restoration is going to take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this restored nation will be the centerpiece of the ones living in his sight during that, put the timeline up again, 7,000 year, all the way to the right there, period, the millennium. Which, according to these scriptures, is the third day after Calvary. After Jesus' death and resurrection. That is when the third day begins. 2,000 years. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, at 2,000 years, you get to the third day, which is the 7,000 year beginning of the millennium, that takes us all the way to the eighth thousand year. God has a plan for that nation. He has a plan not only for the Jews but for the whole house of Israel. I think that's where I'm going to leave off tonight because my time is running out. But it's food for thought. The scriptures are loaded, folks, of God's intentions from the beginning until the end. And if you thought this was fascinating, and it is, just hang on to the journey we're going to go through. That proves to anyone that doubts about God's creation timeline, whether it exists or not, it will prove not only it does exist, but God repeatedly throughout His Word goes out of His way to prove it to us, I believe, for the purpose to increase our faith. To solidify our trust in Him. 
that he knows what he's doing. He has the plan. He is in control of it. We might not like what happens between zero, zero, year zero and the year 7,000, or the year 6,000, excuse me, and 7,000, the beginning of it. We might not like we have to go through, through those periods that we have lived through from the beginning until the end before his return. But while we're living it, we can see how faithful his word is. How faithful he is to his word. And how faithful he has been to us to give us his word that constantly says, says the same message over and over that what he started he will finish we just have to hang on and go for the ride we just have to keep being strong and, our, and of good courage and keep our flame burning that was the message I preached. Keep being strong and have good courage and keep your flame burning. God always had a plan. He always had a timeline. Not just in the big picture of things, but also for your life. That's why I put my trust and confidence in Him. To see me through. To see how everything He has under control according to his plan, encourages me and builds my faith. Hopefully it does the same for you. So be strong and have good courage and keep your flame burning. Plenty of song.